Correct, you were the musical one, so I was thinking you could sing. Dun dun dun! History, <laughs> happy, hour. happy hour, happy 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 hour. So welcome to History Happy Hour, and please check in in the comments and let us know you're here and tell us what cocktail you might have brought to History Happy Hour today. And Chris, what about you? What did you bring? I have a uh, Doom Bar, Amber Ale. All right. Well, I'm drinking a Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. But I'm drinking it in a, I don't know if you can see it, a Leinen Kugel mug. Oh, so you're, okay. All right. So, Very nice. all of which have nothing to do at all with our topic today, the American Revolution. Didn't you tell me last week? I, I, we'll talk okay. about him later. Yeah, we'll talk about whoever this is later as well. This is made by my mother in law 50 years ago. So, we got to love it. You said you weren't going to mention that. I said I was going to mention that. <laughs> All right. So we, we're getting off to a great start. Did well, I interrupt we, you? No, no. I was going to say I'm, I'm glad folks um, have tuned in, and we hope that this will be a little bit free form. Uh, we wanted to talk about something other than World War II, at least for one hour. Um, so uh, I think Rev War, Revolutionary War is a topic that's um, of great interest to you, Rick, and me. Um, and uh, we're also uh, looking at to have some, some real experts on about the Rev War uh, coming up in a few shows. But until then, you're stuck with us. And hopefully we can- uh, <laughs> What do you <promote>, Chris? <laughs> I know, but we wanted to talk about it. And um, it's, a, it's obviously an important topic, something that's kind of fascinating to us. Um, Rick and, we and have I slightly get, different perspectives. We'll get into that. Yes, so, we have definitely slightly different perspectives on that. But um, as you've probably seen on the Ambrose site, um, Rick is going to be leading a revolutionary war tour at some point in the future. Uh, We're we hope. hoping it's September, but my uh, my heart says September and my brain says 2021. So we'll All see. Right. Well, um, but we got to do a great uh, site inspection for the trip and we talk about it quite a bit and we argued a lot on the trip uh, and we found out where to get hot wings in Saratoga but uh, we also when we started doing history happy hour I thought it might be great to bring the Rev War into the discussion so we, 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 we plumbed the depths of the restaurant at the best Western in Ticonderoga and, <laughs> and depths low they were <laughs> I hope that the there's no best Western executives listening here, but uh, anyway. But so I, I'm sure I'm sure our listeners want to know what brought you to the best Western in Saratoga. In in Ticonderoga, I was there no. with you, Chris. <laughs> no, but what what compelled you to want to go there with me? Well, um, well of course, we're it's the only hotel <laughs> in Ticonderoga. Well, I, I, I was what I was trying to you're, get you're, at. You're getting back to why am I interested in the Yeah. Revolution. Oh, yeah, very go. clever. I like that. So uh, Rick is a trader, says Gene Templin. Go England. Thank you, Gene. Good. I, don't, I, don't I, a, I knew I liked Gene. I don't have a viewer delete button, so I can't uh, <laughs> get to take off Gene. But but I, you know, I'm a patriot, damn it. Um, so uh, interestingly enough, uh, I have found in my dad's collection of slides a picture of me on Lexington Green when I am seven years old. So my interest in the revolution goes back, and we didn't grow up in Lexington, although I lived there later. My interest in the revolution goes back to there I am. I'm playing with, a, with an air, you know, pretend musket. It's not even no. real. It's just imagined. And I'm firing it at my sister which was, uh, <laughs> I thought, the appropriate thing to do, who was sitting there very disdainfully. But so I've been interested in the revolution really uh, all my life, and, and my interest in history goes back a long time. And being American, Chris, I naturally became interested in the American side of the revolution. This may be hard for you to grasp. <laughs> Lies, all lies. And uh, but then, uh, starting in 1999, well, well, I I moved to Boston in 1986, and some revolutionary things happened there, as you may be aware. And then in 1999, we moved to Lexington, Massachusetts, and I spent uh, almost 20 years in Lexington and did quite a bit of writing and filmmaking about 
Lexington's version of the American Revolution. And if, if your Lexington's version would be that the revolution ended about four o'clock in the afternoon on the 18th of April, and the rest was just mopping up. But, uh, but all those things are what got me involved and interested in the revolution. And how about yourself? Well, I mean, uh, kind of much like you, it started uh, as a young youngster. Um, I uh, born and raised and grew up in Boston. Uh, and I was very, very young during the bicentennial celebrations. And so it was kind of hard to escape um, all the, the Revolutionary War festivities. And it seemed like every weekend um, there was a reenactment or a parade or something going on, uh, which my parents would drag me to with great reluctance. And um, I don't know what it was, but the Redcoats always looked better. They were much snappier dressers. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then... Uh, and then uh, at Bunker Hill, uh, there, they, exactly. your mother-in-law had good taste. Um, I don't know if you remember, Rick, but if, when you would go to Bunker Hill, there was an exhibit there, uh, and all the kids would go, and you would go through this exhibit, and they would ask you questions. And at the end of the exhibit, a very large computer um, would make lots of noise, and lights would go off, and uh, it would spit out. Uh, something that would say you were a patriot or you were a Tory, and you get a little button that you could wear around. Uh, and I must have gone there four or five times with different classes over the years, and every single time I would be the only person in my class that would come out with the button that said I'm a Tory. <laughs> and it got so bad that I would even try to trick the computer. Um, but I never came out a patriot, so um, I. Uh, you know, my, I my my friend Paul O'Shaughnessy, uh, for years, was the commander of the uh, 10th Regiment reenactors, so reenacting the British 10th Regiment at the Battle of Lexington. And his favorite saying uh, in doing this was, I'm from the government. I'm here to help. <laughs> so... But uh, but so so well we've both been interested in the revolution a long time and we have both we've traveled together to Revolutionary War battlefields and um, we did get a, a a question from somebody that I thought was interesting from Lydia who asked us about uh, our unsung or little known heroes from the revolution so maybe that's a, a good place to start uh, with sure. the question that Lydia asked us so. Um, I'll start with you, Chris. What's your, your take uh, on an unsung, overlooked, or little-known Revolutionary War person, and go with that any direction you want to? Well, I mean, I think um, one of the people that, uh, being a loyalist who I've uh, always greatly admired, all of my Canadian friends will know exactly who I'm talking about. Most Americans will not know, and that's um, uh, John Graves Simcoe. Um, here we go. Uh, and... Uh, Simcoe uh, was a, a British officer, went to Eton and Oxford. Um, he uh, starts out uh, at uh, Oxford. He decides that um, academia is not really his bag. He wants to uh, serve in the military. His father had been a naval officer. Um, and his father had actually died during uh, in 1745 when the, um, the colonists and the British took the fortress of Lewisburg. Uh, which we'll probably talk about as we go along. Um, so he was killed during that campaign, um, but he wants to have a military career. He's in the, the 35th Regiment of Foot, uh, and uh, then he'll come to America and he'll serve in uh, the 40th Foot, which was the Royal American Regiment. Um, he serves with great distinction there. Um, and then later on in his service, he will be given command of the Queen's Rangers. Uh, and the Queen's Rangers is a, a unit made up of loyalist uh, troops, so Americans staying loyal to the crown. Uh, they serve with great distinction. Traitors, I mean, traitor, traitor troops. No, I mean patriots, loyal to their king and country. <laughs> um, and uh, they serve with great distinction. And uh, at the end of the war, um, obviously they can't stay uh, in America. Uh, they're forced out uh, and they go to Canada. Simcoe will um, go with them. He will later become uh, um, a government official in uh, Canada. He will found the city of Toronto. Uh, he will become uh, governor general in Canada. He'll be very instrumental 
uh, in the creation of Canada as, as it develops. Um, and he introduces a number of things uh, into Canada, um, English law, trial by jury. Um, he, right from the get-go, uh, abolishes slavery in Canada. Uh, so he's a big proponent of abolition um, and kind of how it gets starts setting up what will uh, become Canada. And then he returns uh, to England where he dies of old age. So um, quite a distinguished career, critically important to the history of Canada, amazingly effective as a soldier um, and, and little, little known um, in the States. I should also say that he wrote a history of the Queen's Rangers. time with the Queen's Rangers, right? Yeah, one of the best uh, kind of eyewitness accounts of the war uh, that you can still get really well done uh, so what's the yeah, what, i would look at it, it's simcoe what's his full name again uh can it is john Grave graves simcoe right so you can probably still find that book i think on yeah uh, we could probably post our list at the end of all this um yes that's a good idea we can post a book list on the on the end of the the thing um so my choice so i i had a number of ways to go with little known figure. A uh, Simcoe, by the way, is S I M C O E, is it not? Mm, that's correct. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, a person who, who I think um, is largely forgotten um, because he died very early is uh, a, a person named Joseph Warren, who was a doctor in Boston. And this is a portrait of him by uh, John Singleton Copley. And Warren, um, you know, he was in his early 30s, but he was basically uh, very important in the Patriot movement in Boston. He is, he's eventually uh, made the president of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress. So he is essentially the, you know, in charge of the rebel government in Massachusetts. He is the guy who sends Paul Revere and William Dawes off uh, on their uh, mission to warn of uh, the movements of British troops on the night of April 18th. And it's worth pointing out here, Chris, and you and I have discussed this, that it's not really just a uh, Revere and Dawes. It's a, right. essentially Warren has worked to set up and he is activating that night a whole network of riders, bell ringers, people firing shotguns, a whole kind of communications network that is going to draw troops uh, from more than 35 towns in Massachusetts, some of them 30 miles away from Boston, uh, down to, to battle the British uh, as they're coming back from Concord uh, to Boston. And he himself takes part in that uh, fighting and he is helping to coordinate uh, the, the American troops fighting that day. And again, something worth talking about, and I think we're gonna try to talk even more about this at some point, there is a lot of coordination. This is not just right. um, Minutemen firing from behind the walls and trees at the British. There's some careful coordination to put a lot of American units in a position to be able to fight against the British on the battle road uh, back from uh, Concord all the way back to Boston. And he's involved in that. He is then made the major general commanding uh, the Massachusetts militia. And uh, at the Battle of Bunker Hill, he's just been made the Major General, a couple of days before. And so he does not want to disturb the existing command arrangements, even though the American commanders essentially ask him to take over. He says, no, I'm going to fight as a private. And he does so, and he is killed in the fighting that day. Um, and if Warren had lived, he was, he was incredibly intelligent. He was a very strong leader it seems really likely to me that he might have become a major figure in the revolution and in the post-revolutionary times. And as it is, I think outside of people who are really uh, fascinated by uh, the revolution, um, you know, he's very little known. Uh, you know, maybe more well-known than Simcoe, but not a lot. Well, I, I would add to the Warren story, one of the other things, the great what-ifs, um, of the revolution and war and from a, from a loyalist perspective uh, is that even in Boston uh, as we were approaching the start of the war um, with the animosity and the hatred and the bitterness and the anger uh, that's coming out of this situation which is a civil war 
Um, loyalists in Boston at the time said that Warren was always very gracious to them. Um, he was not you know, driven by rage or anger. And when word came from the battle that he had been killed, um, there were a number of loyalists in Boston that, you know, sent letters of condolence to the family and grieved at his loss. Um, so another one of the great what ifs was uh, if Warren had survived and stayed involved after the war, when things got very bad for those loyalists um, in Boston, would he have been kind of a Lincoln figure to sort of say, look, you know, it's over and it's done and let's move on. And um, because it did get very nasty and he was he was very young he was i think 34 or 35 when he died so he was way younger than people like george washington or john adams he could have been easily an important figure into the into the early 1800s uh, right. beyond um so uh kind of a, a series of what ifs there uh, there's a um during the fighting at uh, Lexington and Concord on the Battle Road on the way back, he was almost killed by a musket ball. Um, and when his mother heard of that, she, she begged him to be careful. And he said, where danger is, dear mother, there must your son be. And that is uh, the quote that he said. But then when he was killed, um, uh, a, a, a British major, British captain, Walter Lorry, um, he, he buried Warren on the battlefield, and his quote was that he stuffed the scoundrel with another rebel into one hole, and there he and his seditious principles may remain. Just well, the other, more the other thing treatment is, from the, <laughs> the when they went to find his body, Revere was able to identify him because but he'd done his, he, his yeah. dental work. Yeah. So we have a, a question from our, our guest from last week that I don't think we can completely ignore. Uh, uh, Joe Balkowski asks, uh, who, in your opinion, fired first at the Battle of Lexington? Um, so uh, <laughs> give, it, give it your, you, wanna, you want me to go first or do you want to go first? Well, I will say without question, it was the, it was the rebels, without question. Uh, I think that uh, by that point, um, they wanted a spark. They wanted something to get going. They wanted this revolution to start. Um, the British, for their part, had been, you know, had been told, you know, you have to keep a lid on this. Part of the reason they're going there to seize the powder is to take the arms away from the rebels. Um, they're not going to instigate a war. They're not going to fire on subjects. They hadn't been read the riot act, so legally they couldn't even start firing. So without question, it was, it was Rick's, Rick's, Rick's friends. <laughs> One of the interesting uh, things that I always find fascinating on that day, and I've read dozens of eyewitness accounts of that battle and poured through them, as I'm sure has Joe, uh, who, who himself researched a, uh, a Lexington Concord book early on in his career. But um, the, the, one of my favorite quotes that I, sets of quotes that I always present to people is the, um, usually like to put them back to back, is the rebel account that said, I heard Major Pitcairn say, fire, damn you, fire. And next to that is the account of the British officer who said, I heard Major Pitcairn say, don't fire, keep your ranks and surround you. So I think that eyewitness testimony is tough to, to go by in this. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways it could go. I tend to agree with you. I mean, and I tend to think, you know, it, it's also, it, it's, you know, it could be an accident. It could have been on purpose. It could have been a pistol. It could have been a musket. Uh, it, it, when, when even it, in Lexington, when we do the reenactment, they, they have a, a Minuteman. Well, it's not a Minuteman. Lexington did not have Minutemen. But a Lexington militia reenactor fires the first shot. So, um you know, on balance, that seems more likely, although it's also possible that it, it was, you know, muskets are not weapons that are easily controlled and they are easily misfired. And so, you know, I will not say it's 100 percent, but I do tend to agree with you. Well, I would also um, I, I hope we're not jumping tracks here, but I want to answer. Um, Anne sent us a question. Uh, 
Uh, was it true that the British fought using lines and did they abandon that tactic in later wars and that the Americans pioneered guerrilla warfare? Uh, which is a very good question. Um, and I understand why you ask it, uh, but it's full of all kinds of um, mistaken notions about how the war was fought and who did what. Uh, so the great story is that um, the American militia fought behind trees and, um, you know, sniped away at the British and the British marched around in lines and it was very easy for the Americans to shoot them and um, uh, that sort of thing. And the fact of the matter is, is that most of the, uh, most of the Americans uh, fought just as the British fought. They fought in linear tactics. They fought uh, as organized units. Um, first of all, they all train with the same manuals uh, and you were trained to march shoulder to shoulder. Uh, the other interesting thing, one of the great myths of the revolution is that um, at Lexington and Concord, the, the Americans, you know, hid behind trees and took pot shots at the British. Uh, but if you actually look at um, New England at that time, um, there were no trees. The New Englanders had cut them all down for firewood. Uh, I came, when I was living there, I came across an interesting account from a ledger book uh, in 1773. Uh, Boston uh, merchants are bringing firewood in from Canada to keep to heat their houses because they've cut down all the burnable wood anywhere within sight of Boston. Uh, so at Lexington and Concord, um, the Americans are fighting much the same way the British are. Um, there's a wonderful account of the British as they approach, I mean, sorry, the Americans as they approach the British at the North Bridge in Concord. Uh, and the British eyewitnesses say that the Americans approached us as if on parade. So they marched down to, to fight the British. Uh, and what is interesting is if you look at the whole war, um, and this, this comes from Washington, who again had fought with the British during the French and Indian War. He wanted his army to fight as a European army. He trained them to fight as the British fought. Uh, you may have heard of Baron von Steuben. When he comes to America, one of the things that gets him his job is he's going to train the Americans to fight in a linear form, linear tactics. So you actually see the Americans becoming more uh, European, I guess you would say. Uh, at the same time as this is happening, as the war goes on, you find the British adopting more and more um, uh, irregular or looser formations. So... Uh, the British are becoming more like we picture the Americans, and the Americans are becoming more uh, like the British. A, a maybe a slightly different perspective, I and mean, I, I largely agree with you, but it is also true, for example, if you look at a, there's a quote from Colonel Smith, who commanded the uh, British troops uh, at Lexington and Concord, Colonel Francis Smith. And he said, on our leaving Concord to return to Boston, they began to fire on us from behind the walls, ditches, trees, etc., which as we marched increased to a very de great degree and continued without intermission of five minutes altogether. So, you know, there is some contemporary evidence for suggesting it wasn't simply kind of a parade style approach. On the other hand, I love what comes in this quote afterward because I think it also speaks to this maybe a little bit in the other direction where he said, um, I can't think, but it must have been a preconcerted scheme in them to attack the king's troops at the first favorable opportunity, which right. I think it, it clearly was. It, so it's a much more organized. People may have been... Um, using some guerrilla tactics. Lord Percy says that they used the land very well. They used the terrain right. very well to their advantage, but they were uh, operating as an organization. And it's also important to remember, I think in our in our image of this, which may be influenced by um, the Doolittle Prince or other contemporary images, um, we imagine the British troops are marching down the road and, and they're being fired at. They have flanker units out on each side. Absolutely going those, you know, far more than musket range, maybe a quarter of a mile uh, out on each side so that the, the, they are clearing people out of the woods. I mean, when you look at the, this, there's, there's what everybody describes as very hard fighting all day. And at the end of the day, there's 72 British soldiers and 49 colonials dead. This is not a great number of people for the dead, for the number of people who were involved in the fighting. So, um, you know, 
the British were not completely um, just marching on the roads saying, look, we're a target in a red coat. So that is, there's a little bit of mythology there. Well, I, I think to add to that too is that we separate these two events, but you know, 20 years earlier, well, not even 20 years, 10 years earlier, um, the end of the French and Indian War, and a lot of these people that are fighting at Lexington and Concord that April morning are veterans of that earlier war. Uh, so they're bringing that knowledge of how to fight that fight. Uh, we had a question about Robert Rogers of Rogers Rangers earlier. Um, they're, they're experienced soldiers. So Rogers um, had fought, again, a great distinction uh, during the French and Indian War, um, led Rangers, Ranger units. Um, and they actually get the credit uh, for being the first U.S. Ranger unit. The Rangers trace their lineage to Robert Rogers' unit. Um, uh, and then at, 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 during the Revolution, Rogers uh, stays a loyalist and, and, and he raises troops to fight for the king. But the point I'm, I'm trying to make is people on both sides um, had fought in a war a decade before. Um, so the, particularly amongst the New England militiamen, they, they had some sense of the battlefield and as Rick said, how to use the land and use the terrain. Uh, it's, so, it's, been, it's been argued that um, that they may have been more experienced soldiers than the British troops there on the 19th century. Because absolutely. they had, many of those soldiers were conscripts uh, who had not fought in any battles right. at all. So. Right. Where do we go next, Chris? Well, I mean, are there any other folks that we think don't get uh, the shout out they deserve? We tend to be talking a lot about Lexington and Concord. Well, uh, so sure. Uh, well, uh, let me start with a, a brief one and we can go on to some other ones. But here's somebody who I think maybe it won't be brief. Um, um, I think doesn't get uh, enough credit, although we all know his name, uh, which is uh, Benedict Arnold. And, yeah, Good man. So, so he he may not be an overlooked figure, but he is an overlooked um, uh, American hero, I think. And, and Chris, you sent me recently uh, this picture of a plaque on a house in uh, uh, England, in London, right? Did you just come across this? This yeah. is where Arnold yeah. lived uh, after the revolution. So we all remember Arnold as a traitor, and some people say yes, and he was the hero of uh, the Battle of Saratoga. He was the hero of a lot of things in the first two years of the revolution. And he was a man uh, with drive and vision and imagination and leadership abilities. He puts together an army and marches them through Maine, through the wilds of Maine, through some of the most difficult terrain imaginable, marches them up to Quebec where he and then General Richard Montgomery launch a midnight New Year's Eve assault on a fortified city during a blizzard because the enlistments run out the next day. Right. What could go wrong there? So they failed to take the day. But, you know, they could have. There weren't that many British soldiers in Quebec. It could have gone the other way. Benedict Arnold would have been a huge hero at that point. But then he's, he's also involved in, at one point, he raises a navy on Lake Champlain and fights uh, uh, off a British fleet, which leads the British to end their attempts to come south in 1776. And so they don't come south to Saratoga until 1777, at which point the Americans are able to uh, defeat them. And there's another battle uh, at Fort Oriskany uh, uh, during the Saratoga campaign where Benedict Arnold comes out and uh, he uses a trickery to uh, to essentially relieve the uh, British siege of the fort at Oriskany. And I'm not even getting into um, him at, uh, at Fort Ticonderoga with uh, Ethan Allen uh, taking those guns that end up being used by uh, Henry Knox and brought down uh, to Boston and put on Dorchester Heights. So um, I don't think that... Um, Arnold gets enough credit for the positive things he did for obvious reasons. Right. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, and I would say that Arnold, um, certainly amongst the most capable uh, American commanders, he finds, I find that he, he falls victim to 
kind of the chaos that that is in the American command or the, the American government. I mean, he he's one of these people I think that sees um, sees the army and sees what has to happen as a national organization. Uh, and so he's going to Congress and he's demanding, you know, funds and support that he's not getting. Um, whereas, you know, and I think, well, and I think that that ends, causes the discomfort that he, you know, eventually causes him to do what he does. Um, he, he's, he's ahead of the curve, I think, in realizing what, what is going on and what's going to be, what it's going to take to actually achieve victory. Um, and he, he falls victim. Them to to the chaos and the dissension in the content of Congress and and jealousies and pettiness and, and all kinds of things. Um, uh, so, but and I, but I, and I also certainly don't think that uh, the American Army would have been in the shape that it was later on in the war when it becomes a much more professional force without him. You know. So we have a, a questioner who asks us about uh, Nathaniel Green. Um, who is a, a Rhode Islander, Quaker uh, uh, family from Rhode Island, who becomes a general uh, in the uh, uh, American Army, and who is, uh, he, he is also, I, that's, that's a, probably a pretty fair thought to say that he's an underrated commander. He is involved in fighting in the South um, later in the war, in which he's, he doesn't win a lot of victories but he manages to lead Cornwallis on a merry chase through the South and uh, probably does a lot to reduce the effectiveness of Cornwallis's fighting force. Uh, and so he's probably a bit under underrated as well. Well, yeah, and I, I would say um, of Green, Green and, and reminds me a lot of Washington insofar as that they don't win a lot of victories. Right? They're not, maybe not tactically as astute as some of their opponents. Um, but what they do understand is what is important is to keep the army in the field. You know, so both Green and Washington realized it doesn't matter how many times you knock me down as long as I'm, I'm there to get up again at the end of the day, we'll eventually wear them down. So Green is a master of that. And the other thing that Green is incredibly good at is using uh, what he has now, you know, all throughout the war, and this gets back to our earlier question, um, the, there are large numbers of militiamen that fight with the Americans, so they're called out for whatever the emergency is. Washington, for his part, hates the militia. He wants them to go away. He wants them all trained to be professional continental soldiers. And he has some success with that, but not as much as he would like. Green you know, values trained regular professional soldiers, but he understands that the militia are part of this army and he learns um, how to use them. And he uses them to great effect in the Southern campaign at Guilford and Calpins. Um, and, you know, he'll tell them, I, you know, I understand that you're not going to fight this whole battle against the King's troops, but all I need you to do is fire three shots. Right. That's uh, that's Calpins, right? Uh, right. Yeah. And if you can do that, then you can go. And they do it, and what he understands is by doing that, you're wearing the British down, you're keeping, you know, um, every time you you hit a British soldier, he has to be replaced, and the only place he's going to be replaced from is many hundreds, if not thousands of miles away, um, and, and Green gets that. So um, he understands the nature of the, of the war, the conflict, and he understands the nature of the army that's fighting it. So, yeah, he should definitely be be remembered. So we have another question about the uh, AMC series Turn. Have you seen that series, Chris? No. It's uh, about the Culper spy ring. Uh, and it, uh, uh, as the questioner says, the questioner is my wife. As the questioner says, uh, it uh, dr dramatizes the role of the spies, uh, although all of the people in the series are, or many of them are real people. Um, and the question is, how important was the Culper spy ring really? Do you have a perspective on that? I, I'll, all I would say is that um, that Washington really uses intelligence and spies probably much more so than, than anybody else had up to that point. Um, he, he, he certainly embraces the notion of, of figuring out what's on the other side of the hill. 
Um, and I think part of the reason for that, and this this is touches on intelligence through history, he realizes that spies and, and all that sort of espionage intelligence, it's a force multiplier. So right. if you're inferior to your opponent in the field, one way to best him is to learn more about him. So he relies very heavily on, on spies. Um, yeah, this is probably the point in the conversation where I can bring up the ghost army. Um, there you go. I did that for you. <laughs> thank you. But, you know, one of the, the great things about Washington, and it, and, and it fits right into what you're saying, is he's, he's, he's a risk taker. And he's also, he's also good at the bluff. So uh, when uh, he is commanding the American troops in Boston in the winter of 1775, early 1776, he has almost no gunpowder. And one of the things he does is he has them pile up empty barrels, stencil, they fill them with sand and, and stencil uh, you know, information up so that it appears that they have much more gunpowder in the, um, uh, in the Somerville Powder House, uh, it's in Somerville now, uh, than they really do. Uh, because he knows that there's probably somebody reporting back on him. So his understanding of intelligence is not simply, I spy on you, but I understand that you're probably spying on me, and I'm. I don't want you to know that I don't have any gunpowder. And so when he puts those camera, those those cannons up, somebody was asking us earlier about Henry Knox and the fabulous feat of bringing all these cannons, heavy cannons, from Fort Ticonderoga to Boston. When they put them up on Dorchester Heights, the 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 truth is Washington doesn't have very much gunpowder. He can probably only fire those cannon a few times. So that if uh, the British in Boston really wanted to stay, they probably could have. They were probably pretty much convinced to go even before the cannon were up there, but uh, they realized once they were up there that it put them in a tough place if Washington had the gunpowder, and they didn't know that he didn't. So interesting, you know, we think of Washington as, I cannot tell a lie, you know, I didn't chop down the cherry, I did chop down the cherry tree, but he's good at bluffing, he's interested in intelligence, he's ready to fool the enemy any chance that he gets. And he's a turncoat. You know, uh, not not a, by my view of things. He's a he's a fine, a fine uh, um, general president and distiller of fine whiskey. And well, my now, wife would my wife would agree with distiller of fine whiskey. Didn't didn't she do some research uh, on that yep. that led to the the restoration of the distillery there? Yeah, she 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 transcribed Washington's ledger book. Uh, and she kind of discovered or sorted out that uh, Washington made a lot more money as a as a right gut liquor distiller than he ever did as a farmer or a planter. So, and, uh, where is he today? Is all. <laughs> yeah, we could use some more. Um, but uh, I let's see. Just kind of looking at some of the other questions. Um, Neil had asked about Joseph Plum Martin. For those of you who don't know. Uh, Joseph Plum Martin wrote a book called Private Yankee Doodle, and um, it is uh, one of the few uh, accounts by a private soldier, an ordinary soldier in the American Army, um, an absolutely magnificent book. Um, and he talks not only about the experience of fighting uh, during the revolution, but he, he gets a little bit into the psychology of what motivated um, these men that fought in the Continental Army. I think one of the p things that we need to remember is just how close the Americans came to losing it all and just mm -hmm. how small the Continental Army became because people didn't want to fight in it and people didn't think that it was going to win. There were several points during the war uh, where there are more Americans fighting for the British than were fighting in the Continental Army. Um, and, and Martin talks about this and he talks about, you know, what motivated this real hard core of young men to, to kind of stick with it. Um, so again, Private Yankee Doodle is a magnificent book. Um, it gives you some real insight into the, the guys that really do the fighting, the young kids that really kind of saw it through. So um, John Adams famously said that, um, he thought about one third of Americans supported the revolution. One third were opposed to it, and one third were like, "Please leave me alone." Leave me alone. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in quarantine for a while yeah. <laughs> and try to avoid the the, the trouble. Um, and when you talk about uh, 
Benedict Arnold, I mean, I, I think part of what happened with Benedict Arnold is he probably made a judgment that which side he thought was going to win, and he really would rather be on the winning side than the losing side, and, and he was just really wrong. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, given what he saw when he looked around, it would have been hard for him to come to a different conclusion. I mean, it, you know, the, I think, again, that's one of the remarkable things um, is that the Americans were able to win, if you think about it. Uh, just how close they came so often to, to just being defeated. Uh, it's amazing that they succeeded. Yeah, it, it, we, we, we could all be uh, subjects of the Queen. Uh, and, uh, you know, God bless her. <laughs> God bless her. She has been Queen since the Revolution, hasn't she, pretty much at this point? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Pretty much. Hey, so, uh, so one of the things that uh, I... Um, uh, that we, th we, we said we would do, so well, let's try to do it, is talk about some interesting uh, Rev War sites. And as it turned out, when we started to look at that, we ended up in a very interesting subcategory of that, which is interesting Rev War sites that are not in the United States of America, which is a pretty small uh, category. But um, some of them are in the town that you're in, Chris, in London. And so... Yeah. You want to talk about any of those? I can try to pull up the pictures here, and we'll see how good I do. All right. So you have to start. Uh, give me a place. Which picture to pull up? Oh, first? okay. Um, well, why don't we why don't we start with um, Hugh Palace? Okay. Where? I just saw it here, and it just went away. Yeah, there it is. Okay, right. I can find Hugh Palace. You can start talking. It'll be there. Right. I guarantee well, it. I mean, I you know. It, as a loyalist, obviously, it's kind of a special place, and it's uh, that is Q Palace, and one of the things I that is the home of George the Third, King of England, or his most uh, his favorite residence, and it's still there. You can go inside. One of the things I find really interesting about it is it's not opulent. Uh, it's very kind of subdued, given the fact that of who he was. Uh, George the Third is painted out to be you know, the great villain of American history, and um, like so many often happens, uh, historical figures are a lot more complex and a lot more interesting. Um, he was known uh, to be very family orientated. He, he wasn't a typical European monarch. He didn't have lots of mistresses and go crazy. Um, he uh, was very interested in, in horticulture and gardening and uh, and whatnot. Um, he, he did prosecute the revolution. Um, one of the things that is interesting, though, is at the end, um, he was very forgiving and understanding of what had happened. There's a wonderful moment. Uh, John Adams, who, of course, was kind of important to, to the revolution, he goes to London, and he is the first ambassador to the court of St. James. And Rick just posted, that's a picture of uh, Adams' house. In John Adams' Washington. house. Yeah, isn't that awesome? It's still there. Where we can get, we'll get into that in a minute. But Adams, uh, he has to present his credentials to the king as the ambassador for the United States, and he he commented about, "Gee, I wonder how this is going to go since I'm one of the guys that fomented this rebellion." Uh, and he goes to George the Third, and uh, uh, George the Third rose up from his throne, which I guess was unusual. Um, came up to Adams, and he said that, um, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but basically. Uh, he said, I was I was opposed to your leaving. And I said that I would fight till the end, uh, to the very last, to, to, to prevent you from going. But now that you have and that you're an independent, I also said I would be the first to welcome you. So, yeah, the, That scene is, is reproduced in the uh, John Adams um, miniseries, uh -huh. Giamatti playing John Adams. And it is the only seen in the miniseries that is word for word what was spoken in really? reality because somebody had the presence of mind in that room to write down what John Adams said and what right. George III said. And I always find that really uh, quite quite striking. I, I've shown John Adams' house here, but I'm going to hide it for a minute because I want to show something else related to George III. I think this is Norfolk House. Norfolk House, yeah. And so what's interesting, Chris, as you well know, we visit Norfolk House on World War II tours because General Eisenhower had a headquarters here. 
uh, I think during, uh, especially leading up to the invasion of, uh, of North Africa. Well, and more importantly, Frederick Morgan writes the first D-Day plan there. More importantly, Frederick Morgan, the great hero, we should yes. reference you back several episodes of the show. If, you haven't, if you're not keeping up with the previous episodes, I'm not going to tell you what's happening up till now. But, uh, uh, but it's also the building in which George III was, was born. born. He was born yeah. there. So that's also, crazy. Well, I think it's, it's great. And I, I think the other thing, again, for Americans to know about George III is um, he's the longest reigning monarch uh, until Elizabeth in Victoria. Uh, and he finally dies 1820, um, and he suffers. They're not sure of his disease, but he was incredibly sick. Uh, so he was battling um, some pretty debilitating health conditions, but, um, but he basically oversees the defeat of Napoleon. So he manages Britain uh, through probably one of its most trying struggles, uh, and commands uh, and sees the defeat of Napoleon. So he has a, um, a very long reign and he does a lot. Um, people with a lot more knowledge of, of the royal family and, and the Georges than I have, I will also say that it's uh, during that reign that um, you start to see a shift from absolute monarchy to a much more uh, kind of democratic, not democratic, but uh, kind of figurehead monarchy. I don't know how you would say it, but basically, it's not just you know a despotic king saying you will do this, therefore, constitutional monarchy. You start to see a lot more. Of that. And you also have a lot of stuff going on in India at that time, and the development of the Absolutely. British Empire in India. I mean, the United States is the big failure in the in the British Empire building, and they learn from that failure and do things a little bit differently, not always positively, but differently, yep. uh, and manage to to kind of keep the rest of their empire uh, together for quite a long time. Yeah. Um, I want to I want to uh, go back uh, to yes. Diana Testa. So, how far is that from where you live? That's uh, about a 15, 15 minute walk, twenty minute walk. Yeah. So, the what, what I find interesting, you know, is John Adams goes to London as ambassador uh, for the United States, uh, and this is before George Washington is president. It's in the era of the, uh, con, uh, the Articles of Confederation. Um, but he rents this house, and because of that, Grosvenor Square, which is, right. if, you, if you turn the camera around, there's a big park there, and that's Grosvenor Square. That has been like the American center of London for 200 yep. years. Well, and, yep, and I was going to mention, if a lot of our guests have been with either you or I to London on a World War II tour, you've been there. You may right. actually look at that house and not know it. But yeah, Grosvenor Square, um, it becomes uh, where Eisenhower, well, where the American Embassy is, where Eisenhower will have his headquarters. Um, and it was called uh, Eisenhower Platz <laughs> by, the, uh, by the British during the Second World War because there was just so many Americans there. And now uh, if you go there, um, there is a statue of Eisenhower, a statue of Roosevelt, a statue for the Eagle Squadrons, which are the Americans that fought in the RAF during the Battle of Britain. Um, and also very movingly, I think, uh, the 9-11 memorial. So it's still, the American embassy is moved, but it still has a, a definite American presence. 14 Grosvenor Square is also where the Ralph Ingersoll dreamed up the ghost army. So I, I, you I know, you really, mentioned that on your tour. I'm sure I you do, I, I, absolutely, I'm absolutely. Sure I, I, knew, I knew that. So wait. So you gave me grief about mentioning Frederick Morgan and every chance you have, you've been plugging the ghost arm? Correct. <laughs> what, what's the issue? Okay, sorry, just moving on. Okay. Um, so I, uh, uh, oh, I hope I didn't just, I was trying to show another uh, building, Chris. What what building is this? Uh, that's that's Arnold's houses. That's Benedict Arnold's little Benedict London abode. Oh, I was, you know what? I was trying to pull up another one because I also think we have an image of I thought this was it, but I thought this was Benjamin Franklin's house. Is this not? I think that one's. I uh, we you know who knows, but but it's interesting too that uh, that is another site, another Rev War site in Britain would be uh, Benjamin Franklin's house from when he was an ambassador uh, right. or a representative of several of the states, 
And that is now kept as a museum. And it's right. the only house that he ever lived in that I think still stands. And my friend Caitlin Hoffman is, or was at least until recently, and I hope still is, you know, working there uh, as part of the staff at that uh, museum. Uh, so, so that's kind of cool that there's a Benjamin Franklin Museum in London, Museum House in London as well. Which is not that far from the Jimi Hendrix Museum, so that's important too. Well, those are and those two guys. A lot of people don't know about the connections between <laughs> Jimi Hendrix and um, um, Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin so, Franklin. if you could just explain those now, I think we would <laughs> all be, make something. <laughs> we would all be really grateful. They're both um, American. So, okay. So, uh, when when we started talking about non-American or non-USA Rev War sites. A one that you and I have visited together, which is a fine uh, place to visit, is uh, Crown Point, which is um, a fortification, uh, uh, was started out as a French fortification, then became British, then American, up on Lake Champlain. Uh, and it was basically, uh, it was never really assaulted as a fort, but it was used as a staging area by the British when they were coming south and by Americans when they were going north and it changes hands a bunch of times um, and it's a pretty spooky place to visit. Um, uh, there's a big fire there in 1774. It burned down all the wooden parts of it so what you have left are a couple of the barracks buildings uh, and of course all the ceilings are gone and the wood is all gone but it's a uh, it's just right there on the lake and a kind of a, a, a monument to all the fighting which 90% of which is forgotten that takes place in efforts to go up and down Lake Champlain and try to cut off New England from the rest of the colonies. Well, you know, and I think one of the things that I find fascinating about that barracks is, you know, we talked about, um, or Rick had mentioned, you know, the British Empire this is a, a, a period when the empire grows and expands all over the world. Um, and the barracks at Crown Point are built to a plan that's drawn up in London that whenever British soldiers go out somewhere and they need to build a barracks, that's what they build. Uh, and if you've been with me in Scotland, for example, if you go to Ruthven, uh, there's a place called Ruthven Barracks that figures prominently in the Jacobite story. The buildings are exactly the same. Uh, same, same plan, same blueprint. Um, and I just find that very interesting. And you know, we talk about Pax Shurvana, with their roads, this is kind of that same idea. And the, uh, a little bit north of there is a, 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 a the city of Quebec, and I am. Uh, there's a lot of images I could show. I'm really just showing at this point um, the uh, the plains of Abraham and the uh, from the air. And the great thing about Quebec as a Rev War site is Quebec is history layered on history. So you have uh, the 1757 battle in the um, French and Indian War that results in Canada uh, becoming a, a British dominion. And then you have uh, 15, 17 years later, you have the attempt by the Americans to attack Quebec uh, in 1775. And you can see, if you look, um, we put this up full screen and hopefully the quality is good enough, you can see how high it is up on those cliffs. And uh, General Montgomery's force, which was the, the right-hand flank of the, the two-flank attack on uh, Quebec, you know, was coming around and then was going to have to find a way up those cliffs, or up part of them into the, into the upper city there. Well, Benedict Arnold led his force from the other direction. And what I, I think is really cool about Quebec is there aren't many places where urban warfare took place that you can walk down the streets where it took place, you know, because yeah. urban warfare tends to be really destructive of the, the yeah. urban areas, and especially as we've gone on to later wars, World War I, World War II, when there's urban warfare, a lot of those streets are just completely different than they used to be. But in Quebec, there's a lot of original buildings there's a lot of uh, streets where even if there's new buildings, the streets are in the same place. You can walk around the fortifications of the city and you can really get an idea of what happened and where it happened. And if you go with uh, uh, your friendly uh, uh, fellow Chris Anderson, Stephen Ambrose guide, uh, you can even stand there at the spot where 
Uh, General Montgomery was trying to uh, find a way in and find a way up those cliffs and was killed uh, by Canadian riflemen on this spot. And it's, I just think that Quebec is a fantastic site for studying and, and, and kind of getting a feel for the revolution, especially since so much of the old city that was there in 1775 is still there. Well, what I really enjoyed about that trip, Rick, was um, when we got to the city, we wanted to kind of figure out exactly where these things happened. Uh, and I remember we had a great afternoon with all of our accounts and our maps going up and down streets. I, I enjoyed walking down the hill more than walking back up, uh, but it was great to actually, because so much is still there, to walk around and actually nail down where this stuff happened. And that was a lot of fun. Um, the other thing I find fascinating about Quebec and about a lot of these Rev War sites um, is how personalities, how their paths cross. So uh, one of the things that I found in studying the war is that it was a civil war. No matter what side you come down on, these people are all British at the start of it and they have had history before uh, and, and their paths are crossing much like they did during the American Civil War. So. Uh, one of the stories coming out of, of Quebec that I think is kind of interesting is um, Guy Carleton, who's the British officer commanding uh, the defense, uh, to great credit, and he's one of the personalities I think people should know more about. Um, and he's fighting Montgomery, who's leading the American force. Well, during the what, what the British had called the Seven Years' War, what we call the French and Indian War, uh, Carleton and Montgomery had served together uh, during the British attempt to seize Havana. So they were familiar, they were known to one another. They had fought side by side. Uh, and um, I'm also fascinated by the people who were at uh, Quebec who were involved in later things. We talked about Benedict Arnold being there. His aide was a 19 year old named Aaron Burr. There was a, uh, an officer from Virginia leading a company of riflemen named Daniel Morgan who was captured by the British, exchanged uh, in early 1777, just in time to become an important figure in the Battle of Saratoga that takes place later that year. And then I think isn't, I'm, the Southern fighting is not my area of expertise, but isn't he also involved in uh, the Battle of Cowpens? Um, and so he's a very important figure. Um, Henry Dearborn, who later became a Treasury Secretary of the United States is at that battle. Um, and other people, and it's uh, and it's it's this it's this forgotten forgotten battle. So I I agree. I think it's a really kind of a cool intersection. And there are other people. I think that they've identified a couple of dozen people who fought in both battles, who fought both mm -hmm. in 1757. People on both sides who yeah. fought uh, uh, with each other in 1757 against each other in 1775 in basically the same place. Yep. Yeah. So, Chris, I, I want to. We, we have a few minutes left. Maybe we'll run two minutes over. But I want to put a picture up here because we talked about this picture, and I'm going to put it up. And I'll hide you and I, and hopefully you can still hear us talk. But this is a picture of the surrender at Saratoga, and uh, we've been at this site, um, and that's uh, General Gates in the middle. Uh, that's the. Um, uh, 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 Johnny Burgoyne, the British commander on the left. I think Daniel Morgan is there in that fine white suit on the right. But you were telling me about somebody in this picture that's kind of an interesting story, and I have one as well. So you go first. Okay, so um, he's uh, lost in the crowd there, but uh, William Prescott, uh, and he's uh, one of the characters who, again, I think is, is very overlooked. He commands... Um, the, the, the Americans at uh, Bunker Hill. And Prescott uh, is responsible for um, where, the, where the readout is placed. Uh, he's the guy that uh, basically keeps the Americans in the readout and, and commands them when they, when they deliver the first great check to the British, when the British realize, hey, these Americans are gonna stand and fight. And uh, um, he's, he's hugely important, instrumental during, to, during that battle. Uh, in recognition of his service, he's given command uh, of a Massachusetts regiment. He uh, participates as a colonel in the campaign in New York. Um, and then he just drops off the map. Uh, he just kind of disappears 
uh, and he shows up in that Turnbull painting. Um, so people think that he had some involvement in the battle at Saratoga, uh, but they're not sure what that involvement is. Uh, so here's a guy who's who's critical uh, in the start at the start of the revolution, um, and he just disappears. And uh, we'd like to know more about him. So I, I, I there's somebody in this painting that uh, interests me as well, and uh, he is over on the far as I look at the screen, he's on the far right hand side, leaning with a little bit of casual attitude uh, against that cannon. And his name is Ebenezer Stevens. And if you look at the picture, what one of the things that I think is kind of interesting is he's actually bigger in this picture than anybody else. He's bigger than Daniel Morgan. He's way bigger than Burgoyne. And you could say, well, that's just a you know, that's because of perspective or whatever, but the artist has chosen to make him bigger. And Ebenezer Stevens was, um, grew up in Boston, was involved in the Boston Tea Party, left an account of his experiences in the Boston Tea Party, gets involved in artillery, uh, and up in, um, at uh, Fort Ticonderoga, he is, he is one of the people who thinks that, um, that, that, that they should put artillery on the top of Mount Defiance and nobody will listen to him. And so he and another guy go out to um, do an experiment to prove that you can fire artillery essentially from Mount Defiance and hit boats in the water, hit the fort, uh, and um, people ignore this experiment. But what's interesting is that the person that he performs this um, experiment with is in fact John Turnbull, who paints this painting. So in other words, it's not simply that um, Ebenezer Stevens, who is an artillery commander at Saratoga, it's not just because maybe he has an important role there, it's because he's a buddy of the painter. And so, well, buddy, you know, you know uh, and if you get in on that close up here, and I think we can uh, have him join us, there he is uh, as a buddy of the painter. And then I found recently, um, in uh, the National Portrait Gallery, there's another painting of him by John Turnbull uh, done 15 years later in looking in the same direction in, <laughs> in 1791. So, you know, and, and Turnbull also has a really interesting history. You know, we look at these paintings sometimes and we imagine, you know, we think about the people in the paintings, but we forget about the people who made them. And both John Copley and John Turnbull, who knew each other and who were probably two of the major uh, painters uh, at the time of the revolution and, and shortly thereafter in America, both have really interesting stories in connection with the revolution. And so that's, that's a whole nother, another, it's probably a whole other topic for us someday. Yes. Well, I was gonna say, you know, we, um, this was a little uh, kind of over the board, all over the board. It's a huge topic, but it's one that, that Rick and I really love. Um, and uh, as we go forward, we'll probably revisit this. Uh, we're working on some folks that can come and talk to us about some real kind of detailed stuff um, about the revolution. So we, we encourage you to, to shoot us some questions about it, but we're gonna revisit the topic because it, it really is fascinating. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's and, and you know, we are, we are only five years away from the 250th uh, anniversary of the Battle of Lexington. I mean, I think we're only going to see a lot more in the coming, you know, years about the revolution. And it's a, a fa fabulous, amazing story. And like World War II, it's a story with a million avenues and rabbit holes that you can go down and interesting people and stuff. So I look forward to exploring it on the Stephen Ambrose tour sometime soon and um, leading people there and talking about it soon with you, Chris. Excellent. So thanks, thanks for, thank you everybody for joining us in another History Happy Hour. And we will, we have some more guests planned for coming weeks. So look for that, probably have an announcement Wednesday about some of the stuff in upcoming weeks. And uh, we're not going any place. <laughs> we're here. Neither are you. And neither <laughs> are you. <laughs> There's our tagline. <laughs> Thanks, Chris, and thanks everybody else for joining us. Take care.